Hello and welcome to Holocaust Museum LA's monthly series Inside the Acid-Free Box. My name is Jordana and with me is Christy, who's not quite with me, but is in the archive at Holocaust Museum LA. And we're here to th this month to explore a behind the scenes look at the female founders of Holocaust Museum LA in honor of Women's History Month this month in March. We were really excited about the prospect of doing a themed Inside the Asset Free Box this month about women for Women's History Month. And there are just so many incredible stories of women survivors, rescuers, even victims from the Holocaust. But we decided that we wanted to actually focus uh, a little bit later than uh, when the Holocaust took place and look at two of the founders of our museum who happened to be women. As many of you know, Holocaust Museum LA was founded in 1961 by a group of Holocaust survivors here in Los Angeles who met and understood that they each had a precious document, photograph, or story that they wanted to hold dear and preserve for future generations in order to educate on the important lessons and social relevancy of the Holocaust. And these two women today that we'll be talking about, Esther and Masha, are the two of these founders who are women and really just incredible, courageous, forward-thinking individuals who in the 1960s understood that their stories mattered and that their stories needed to be told and retold for future generations. So thank you so much for joining us um, and let's get started. Christy, why don't you tell us a little bit about the archival collection for those who are joining us for the first time? Yeah, so <clears throat> as you can see, I'm at the museum in our archives room uh, where the museum's collection is stored that's not on display. So we have about 610 collections altogether that make up the museum's collection with uh, roughly 20,000 artifacts, documents, and other materials. Um, many of these collections relate to a particular person or family, um, such as the ones that we're going to talk about today, and they include materials such as photographs, documents, three-dimensional objects, so things like badges, pins, textiles, other family heirlooms um, that managed to survive the war, and then, of course, oral history and testimony. So as Jordana mentioned briefly in the introduction, the genesis of the collection of the museum dates back to the 1960s uh, when a group of survivors actually met uh, and discovered that they each had an item that they wanted that had survived the war that they wanted a place to basically be able to keep, keep and store it um, for future generations. And then they decided that these artifacts really needed a permanent home where they could be displayed. And so we're looking at a picture of some of the founders of the museum right now and the two women that we're going to be discussing today are actually in this picture. Uh, we will touch on it in a little bit more detail at the end after we run through the details of each um, of the women's lives. It's just so incredible to think that the 20,000 documents we have today all started with this group of survivors and they may have only had one document, maybe they had zero possessions from the Holocaust because really when we think about Holocaust history and this traumatic event, people didn't just lose their families, but they lost their homes, their worldly possessions. Many survivors, and actually Masha Lowen, I think is a really good example of this, survived the Holocaust to only have nothing. She had no artifacts, no photographs from her life before the Holocaust. She was unable to retrieve any of those. They'd all been destroyed. And so this group of survivors, maybe they had one thing, maybe they had zero things, maybe they typed up their oral history on a typewriter and that was their artifact. Um, and now it's just grown tremendously to, to be over 20,000 artifacts. It's such an incredible thing to consider as we enter this uh, talk today. So first we'll be looking at um, Esther Przorowski Pratt in her pre-war life in Poland. We'll be looking at both of these two women, Esther and Masha, um, going through their pre-life their pre-war lives, um, their experiences during the Holocaust, and then taking us to when they began founding the museum. So born in Czestochowa, Poland in 1913, Esther, Esther was one of six children. Um, she's in this photograph on the right-hand side uh, between two men, so she's the third from the right. And this is her with her family. Um, her younger sister, who we'll hear a lot about Tamara, is seated next, uh, is the youngest child seated in the fourth person from the left. Um, and then of course you can see her mother and then one of her brothers, I believe wives is there as well. 
Um, she graduated with a law degree from the University of Warsaw and became one of only two female lawyers in her town. She was a well-respected leader among her peers and helped organize galas and other events for the legal community in Chestahova. Yeah, so when we talk about Esther and, you know, in particular this picture, I want to give a little shout out to Esther's nephew, Belvin, because he was kind enough to share some of the photos um, of Esther's life pre-war and his mother as well, Tamara, uh, because we don't really have, like Joanna mentioned, we don't have a lot of materials from um, before the war for Esther. A lot of what we have is post-Holocaust uh, and, you know, related to her testimony. We have a few photographs, but it wasn't until we we sort of went down this path of putting together a talk for this month uh, and were able to reach out and connect with Melbourne that we were able to come across some of these documents. So like Jordan mentioned, I don't know if you want to go a little bit well, so I can show it a little bit closer. Um, it's this copy of the photo. So you can see up close here, um, this is a picture of the whole family. So Esther was one of, um, she had four brothers and a sister. Um, she was kind of in the middle there in terms of age. Uh, and she was a lawyer. So she would go on to uh, get her law degree from the University of Warsaw and practice for two years uh, in Chesterhova. Uh, and she was basically, you know, at that time, that is no small feat, to be honest. I mean, it's probably no small feat to be able to become a lawyer at any time, really. Uh, but particularly at that time, um, you know, there were only 36 lawyers in total in Chesterhover and Esther was, in, was one of only two lawyers. And at the time when she managed to pass her exams in 1937, out of 100 applicants, uh, there was only 16 that actually passed the exam. And only six of those were Jewish and it was five men and her. So, you know, you can just see just from those numbers that it was no small feat to be able to, for her to achieve that uh, and to be able to set up her own practice and practice law as a woman um, in Chesterhover at that time is, is really remarkable. Uh, and so lawyers within the town and the surrounds belong to many different associations and clubs uh, and arranged parties and other social events um, that were attended um, by the community there. And so Esther was part of that. As Jordana mentioned, she was definitely a community leader and she was involved in um, arranging balls and other things that were attended by the legal community there. So we also have this photo as well, courtesy of Melvin, which is actually a picture of one of the last galas or one of the last balls that was held in Chesterhover before um, the war broke out. So you can see Esther is just here and sitting in the front row right here. And really from these photographs, you can see, and they really capture what daily life was like in Poland for the Jewish community. Um, Poland at that time had the largest Jewish community in the world. Um, over 3 million Jews lived in Poland. And so for just thinking about this like rich and diverse Jewish life that existed, that was completely destroyed during the Holocaust. And it was a really, you know, Jews have lived, have lived in Poland for a thousand years. So there were families and towns and cities in which Jews had been members for generations. Um, you know, people either worked as professionals like Esther as an attorney. And even though it was unique for a, a, a woman to be an attorney, it was not unique at that time for Jews to be attorneys. Um, they were also farmers, there were rich Jews, there were poor Jews, there were Jews that lived in cities, there were Jews that lived in towns and shtetls. Uh, Warsaw, which we mentioned, which was the capital of Poland and which was where Esther went to university, the population of Warsaw, 30% of the population was Jewish. So that's a significant population um, of Jews living in Poland and who were really active and engaged in the economy and in society. And we actually have a map here. Um, so you can see, you know, Poland's largest Jewish communities on the eve of war. So this map depicts those cities in interwar Poland. So between World War I and World War II with a Jewish population of over 12,000. So quite a number of cities here have a Jewish population of over 12,000. And it also includes the Jewish percentage of the total population of the city. And so Chestahova is here. Um, it's a little small, so let me see if I can grab it. Here's Chestahova. So um, about 20, over 20,000 Jews lived in Chestahova and that was 30% of that um, population of the city. And it's just remarkable to think like here's Chestahova, this, this sizable small city within Poland um, and 
28,000 Jews, 30% of the population. And then of course, here's Warsaw, where you can see um, you know, 350,000 Jews, 29% of the population. So it's just interesting to kind of ground us in where we're talking about what the format is. And this is where Esther was living on the eve of the Holocaust. So what that remember, oh, excuse okay. me. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about Masha Lowen. She was from Lithuania. She was born in 1930 in Kovno, Lithuania. Masha was one of three daughters. The family was observant, and Masha recalls fond memories of holidays and other celebrations from her childhood. The rich Jewish cultural life of Kovno was disrupted when the Soviet U Union occupied Lithuania in June of 1940, which we'll talk about in one second. Um, and Masha's family had their belongings taken away, and her father uh, lost his job, his, his tailoring business. He was a tailor. Masha and her family initially tried to escape, but they ended up returning home after they witnessed a horrific pogrom committed against Jews by the Lithuanians. And here we're going to listen to a, a short clip of Masha talking about her childhood in pre-war Lithuania. It was a very long table and everybody came. And then there was a big, tall, silver on the end of the table, silver cup that was filled with wine. And by the end of the Passover, when they left in when they left in Eliua Novi, they opened all the windows and doors, and I could have sworn to you at that time, when, till it ended, that he was there and he was drinking. And as I got older, I knew that it was the flow of the air from one window to the others, or maybe it was there, I don't know. But for me, Eliua Novi was always there. And the Aliuanovi, Al yes. And they baked. And at my grandfather's and my grandmother's house, we had a, a, a woman from Poland, Alune, that spoke better Yiddish than we did. And she was with the family for 25 years. She helped us a lot during. She was Jewish? No, she was Christian. And then we had a Jewish help. So what happened is before Passover also was a terrific time is when they they went and picked up the matzes and when they made the wine and they made the fava and they make they baked those beautiful sponge cakes and it was such an activity that you have no idea absolutely magnificent activity and mad they made. They call it a champagne. It was made out of hops. And sometimes after Passover, we were lying in bed and in the cellar, it would go pop. They corked it themselves. They corked the wine. They corked everything. Everything was made for Passover, it was made in my grandmother's kitchen. I loved that story. And when Christy and I were talking about um, clips of Masha's interview from the Shoah Foundation, it reminded me, first of all, because we're currently celebrating the holiday of Passover. And when I was also a little kid, I remember, it's, I think, a very traditional Ashkenazi tradition to put out a cup for Eliyahu Anavi and um, Elijah. And so when she was talking about watching the cup, I remember myself as a kid watching the cup, we would open the door and invite him in. And, you know, as a kid, I would be convinced that he was drinking from the cup. And of course, as an adult, I understand that the wind was probably blowing in from a window or a door. And it's the exact same story that Masha was saying. And it's so important for us when we're telling these stories to think about not only Jewish life that existed before the Holocaust, but really consider the ways in which traditions and customs in any culture continue despite a mass atrocity like a genocide. And that there's still just a few nights ago, Jews across the globe opening their doors and welcoming Eliyahu Anavi to share in a glass of wine at their Seder um, table. So it's just exactly as Masha is describing it from before the war. Um, and then here we have um, a map that kind of explains now the outbreak of World War II. So the Soviets and the Germans, um, despite you know Nazis being very adamantly against communism in their propaganda, uh, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany signed a non-aggression pact and they both invaded 
Poland um, in 1939. And this map identifies the new border that was agreed upon between the Soviet Union and Germany per the non-aggression pact. And of course, you know, this impacts both Esther, who is now 1939 under Nazi control um, and impacts Masha, who is now under Soviet control um, for the time being. And really there's a number of different, you know, going to Esther's story in Poland, Czestochowa, the town that in which she lived or the small city in which she lived was invaded by the Nazis that September 1939. And it was incredibly bloody. Um, the Nazis actually murdered several Jews that day or in those days leading into the, um, in, in the invasion. Um, and just their target was to get rid of the intelligentsia, people who were looked up to in the community. So I can imagine Esther being a community member, pretty active, was probably quite terrified during that time um, of the invasion. And for Masha, you know, being under the Soviets, her father lost his business and they lost a lot of their belongings. So life also changed dramatically for her as well. Um, so now looking at Esther, Nazi invasion, the ghetto and deportation. So as I said, following the Nazi invasion of Poland in 1939, Esther and her family were forced into the Czestochowa ghetto. Uh, the Nazis performed a mass roundup in September of 1942 where many were deported to Treblinka death camp. Esther and her remaining family were forced into a smaller ghetto in Czestochowa as the Nazis were actually what they called liquidating the ghetto, which meant deporting Jews from the ghettos into or to the death camps. And really this process of ghettoization was because I mentioned earlier how Poland had this huge Jewish community and the Nazis wanted to better control them. So forcing Jewish communities into ghettos, um, into areas where there were horrific living conditions. You can actually see a map of the Czestochowa ghetto here. And um, the Jews were not allowed to leave. They were given very little food, almost no medical attention. Um, and this was really a way to control, but also weaken um, and, and slowly murder um, the Jewish community as under the Nazis. Um, so Esther was appointed as part of the Judenrat of, of the ghetto and was put in charge of the apartment repairs and her older brother Jacob was a member of the Jewish police. And just a little information about the Judenrat. This was, um, you know, they're called Jewish councils, Judenrat in German. Um, and they were established by the Nazis and ghettos to again, control, to best control um, the Jewish community living in the ghetto, but so that the Nazis could control from afar. Um, the Judenrat in Czestochowa was established um, on the basis of an order from Nazi authorities that actually occurred in all ghettos and cities across Poland. Um, it was actually not an ind individualized order. It was really actually a systematic order that came from the top of the Nazi government. Um, and, uh, sorry, Christy, did you want to add something here about Esther in the ghetto? Yeah, I mean, we, like I mentioned before, we don't have a lot of documentation or photos or anything about Esther from that time, but we do have a substantial amount of testimony within her collection. So she um, was very diligent about documenting her story after the Holocaust. And so, and as we'll talk about later, she was also prolific in speaking about her experiences at various events to various students and like educating the public as well as giving speeches. So we know a lot about her life at this time from those materials. So she talks a bit about the fact that, um, you know, the first liquidation of the ghetto that occurred, um, she was there for that. And, you know, approximately 40,000 Jews were deported to Treblinka at that time. And she later discovered her parents were actually killed at Treblinka. Um, and so, after that, those who remained were essentially forced into a, a small ghetto, a smaller version of the ghetto. Uh, and that was when Esther became part of the Judenrat and was put in charge of apartment repairs for the ghetto. Um, and, you know, she was really part of, I guess, the intelligentsia within Chesterhova. And so, you know, as a well-respected member of the community, um, you know, that's how that kind of appointment resulted. And so she ultimately resigns this position. And she talks about this in her testimony as well because of uh, clashes with the head of the Judenrat um, because she felt that he was giving essentially preferential treatment to certain more affluent, affluent families that were living within the ghetto at the expense of those that were less fortunate. Uh, and so she, it ended up actually being fortuitous timing for her because not too long after she relinquished that position, um, the ghetto, the, uh, the guards in charge of the ghetto actually rounded up the intelligentsia 
um, and the members of, of the Yudinrat with their, and their families were essentially instructed to assemble at the gates of the ghetto. And they were told that they were going to be taken to um, New Palestine under a pass with the Red Cross. Uh, and then essentially what happened was the prisoners were marched out and taken to the cemetery nearby and shot and put into mass graves. And so, um, you know, Esther was there to essentially witness that and was saved essentially because she had relinquished her position not too long before that. And so wasn't um, called up as part of the Yudinra and intelligentsia that were killed at that time. Yeah, and as we mentioned, her brother was part of the Jewish police, and the Jewish police in Chestahova were established sort of, you know, to be, to kind of guard the streets and sort of police the streets of the ghetto, um, maintain some sort of law and order that was established by the Judenrat, so really established by the Nazis, um, making sure people kept curfew, uh, just sort of in, in putting and imposing all of the different laws and restrictions that the Nazis forced the Judenrat to impose. And I think from what Christy just shared, there are a few very important takeaways. And one is that the Nazis specifically targeted Jews to be part of the Judenrat, who were already leaders in the community, who they felt that other Jews might look up to. So maybe it's rabbis, cultural um, rep or members, political members, um, also, you know, lawyers, perhaps people who were revered within the community. But the Judenrat did not represent the political movement of the Jewish population. They were really forced and not given quite a choice. Um, and oftentimes being a member of the Judenrat did not save Jews' lives. And as Christy mentioned, they were ultimately also murdered by the Nazis. The Nazis were mainly just using them so that they control they could control the ghettos um, from afar and didn't need to do the, the dirty work um, within the ghetto. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to note too, as you mentioned, Jordana, that her brother was part of the Jewish police that policed the ghetto, um, particularly because, you know, and we've talked about this before, that, it, such positions were really controversial because they did afford some level of protection for the individual and maybe their families and maybe even avoid being deported for a time. But the job often meant that you were seen by your peers and your community as a Nazi collaborator and, you know, despised really. Uh, and so, and then, you know, you're faced with these impossible decisions of, do I comply with Nazi orders knowing that this is likely spelling the deportation and death of people who are my neighbors and fellow community um or you know do i say no and then potentially put my own life in jeopardy um and so you know this is we we don't know too much about the story of um esther's brother but we do not know that he was part of the jewish police and so this is potentially something that he faced on a regular basis and you know something that we will touch on a little bit later um is that we know that he was he was ultimately recorded as being killed in 1943 and Esther actually references in her testimony that he was shot at the cemetery along with his wife and two children um, but you know it's possible that his experiences were the catalyst for Esther acting as a defense attorney for other Jews who are facing the accusation of being collaborators in um, trials that happened after the war. Yeah, I think Esther really saw firsthand the true horrors of the Holocaust and the impossible decisions that people had to make to try to save their lives. And oftentimes they did, they were unable to survive because two out of every three Jews in Europe were murdered during the Holocaust. Um, so Operation Barbarossa. So we mentioned how the Nazis invaded Western Poland in September of 1939. Um, actually in June of 1941, the Nazis now invade their ally, the Soviet Union. Um, so they invade the Soviet Union in June of 1941, breaking that non-aggression pact that we mentioned. And under the cover of war, the Nazis begin the mass murder of European Jews. So from 1939 to 1941, the Nazis were murdering Jews, um, but now it's actually a systematic mass murder, really a, a true genocide that is taking place under the cover of war. So as the Wehrmacht, the German army, is, is pushing the Soviet Union through Eastern Poland and then the rest of Eastern Europe back into what we now know as Russia, they are sending in these units called Einsatzgruppen units that are going into these towns, villages, and cities, rounding up Jewish populations and shooting them and murdering them. Um, so for Masha living in Lithuania, she is witness to these Einsatzgruppen units invading as the Nazi army quickly comes through Lithuania and pushes into what we now know as Russia. 
So with the Nazi occupation of Lithuania in the summer of 1941, Masha and her family are confined to the Kovno ghetto. And in July of 1941, the Einsatzgruppen in Lithuanian auxiliaries begin systematically murdering Jews um, in forests that surround the ghetto. Masha's grandparents and other family members are immediately killed, um, but Masha's immediate family were saved due to her father's position as a tailor. The family narrowly escaped death during a mass roundup in 1941, when approximately 9,200 Jews were taken from the ghetto and shot in a single day. Um, so it's a really horrific um, event that is taking place. And I really think it's important to mention that at the end of the Holocaust, 93% of the Lithuanian Jewish community was murdered. And that is a very significant, if not almost entirely, community that is killed. Jews lived in Lithuania for a very long time. There was a beautiful and rich culture there. Um, the, the capital of Lithuania was known as the Jerusalem of the West, and it was a vibrant Jewish community. And really understanding that 93% of the Jewish community of Lithuania was murdered, how could it be so complete? And unfortunately, part of that is because of the collaboration of Lithu local Lithuanian non-Jews who collaborated oftentimes eagerly with the Nazis and with members of the Einsatzgruppen to not only point out where Jews lived or point out family or families who might be hiding Jews, but to then even go as far as to engage in the mass murder themselves. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that, Jordana, because Marsha actually mentions it in her show, A Testimony, which we've watched a couple of clips of, um, how she and her family actually were witness to this horrific, violent pogrom that was um, basically enacted by the Lithuanian forces before the Nazis actually arrived. So there was definitely that, uh, you know, violence that was happening already um, before Nazi forces even even um, arrived in the ghetto. So she talks about um, in her testimony as well, and you can see it a little bit on the map. I know the map's a little bit small, but she talks about some of the um, the actions and and roundups were were basically centered around these forts that were had been established outside um, of the city, uh, essentially in the 19th century that were and were intended for defense of the city. And so Nazi and Lithuanian police uh, basically rounded up Jews from the ghetto and took them out to these forts to be shot. And so Marsha's um, grandfather and grandmother were killed in an initial action early on that in this way. Um, and the rest of the family actually narrowly escaped death during a later action um, that Marsha talks about in her testimony because her father, who had been a tailor, you know, considered to be a useful occupation, uh, had um, tailored a suit for a, a particular guard. And this guard was actually at the um, area where the action was happening and where the Jews had been rounded up and recognized her father and took him out of line and said, take your family and go back to the ghetto, essentially saving his life. Um, at that time, only their immediate family was present. Uh, and so her father was able to say, well, this person is my family and that person is my family in, in terms of an extended family and save others from, you know, certain death as well. Um, and then, you know, Marsha also talks about a later um, action with the Nazis rounding up children in the ghetto. And at that time, she was out on a work detail outside of the ghetto and her father was out from their apartment at work as well and when she came back and discovered what had happened you know she had two younger sisters one of which who had only just recently been born actually in since the ghetto had been established um, and she was just convinced she knew that they were at home with her mother and she was convinced that they would have been killed or taken and so it particularly came back she came back with her father to their apartment and discovered that it was empty um, you know, immediately thinking that they had been killed until she heard some knocking coming from one of the walls or the roof and realized that her mother had actually been able to think very quickly and hide um, within the roof of their apartment so that the children wouldn't be taken. And uh, thinking about this, the Jewish community that lived there, I mean, Jews had lived in Kovno as early as 1410. So really a rich Jewish community in Lithuania um, you know, in the 1930s, there was a Jewish museum that was opened there that had already collected 3,000 Jewish artworks and artifacts. And this is in the 1930s before this takes place. Um, 1938, the Jewish population of Kovno, where Masha's from, was 40,000. Um, so this is a really beautiful community, a rich community um, that is completely destroyed in a brutal, horrific way. And Masha is witness to all of this. 
So Esther and her sister Tamara um, are back in the concentration, uh, I'm sorry, in the ghetto in Czestochowa in Poland. Um, and they'd been, as we mentioned, had been moved to a smaller ghetto. And she and her sister are actually selected to be sent to a concentration camp, the Hasag concentration camp. And Hasag was a German munitions manufacturer. Um, and actually this company, the Hasa company was founded in Leipzig in 1863. So this is an established um, German company that engages um, during the Holocaust in using slave labor in paying the Nazi government for slave labor. Hasag was actually the third largest user of slave labor in Germany out of the German companies. It unfortunately was not unique for German companies to partake and engage in the Holocaust. Um, by using Jewish slave labor um, as, you know, in enslavement for free. It was actually not free labor because these German companies paid the SS for the use of the labor, but of course the laborers were not paid. And Hasag employed more women than they employed men in these uh, concentration camps because the SS charged less for women laborers. Um, and this is a part of the Holocaust history that I think is oftentimes not discussed and overlooked. The way in which not just German individuals, but German companies were invited to participate in mass murder and genocide and actively engaged and participated in mass murder and genocide. There are numerous German companies. So Hasag actually um, was fell apart after the Holocaust and it did not continue to be a company to today, but there remain German companies today that were engaged in um, exploiting Jewish slave labor um, and the life expectancy at these camps were months. Um, they were beaten, they were tortured, they were given very little food, very little water, and they were forced to work in factories under horrific conditions um, just to produce for the SS and to produce for these German companies. The sisters were eventually deported to Robinsbrook and then to Dachau where they were liberated by US forces. And I know Christy has an artifact for us to look at. Yeah, so uh, incredibly, actually, we don't have necessarily have this artifact in our collection, but one of our staff was able to track down some additional artifacts about uh, related to Esther. So this is actually the, the document that she was given after the war, which she was looking at a picture of a moment ago, but it basically confirms that she was a prisoner of a concentration camp. Um, this particular document relates to Dachau, uh, which is ultimately where the sisters were liberated uh, by American forces. Um, but it's just, it's incredible to me, Jordana. I know you mentioned that, that the life expectancy um, of people in these camps was months and the sisters were able to survive for over two years um, and until they were deported to Ravensbrück and then ultimately onto a subcamp of Dachau. Like that is just incredible that they're able to survive. I know, I mean, it's, you know, when, you, when you're talking about concentration camps during the Holocaust, there were over 40,000 ghettos and concentration camps established by the Nazis across Europe. Um, of course, there are always the concentration camps that I think many of us have heard, of course, Auschwitz-Birkenau, um, being the largest of them with many, many different subcamps. Because you also have to remember these camps actually had subcamps. Um, and in fact, Auschwitz-Birkenau had also an ammunition, had a, a, a factory that was um, rented out to a German company called IG Farben, where um, this was called Auschwitz III, but the prisoners actually called it Buna um, because that is the word for synthetic rubber. And that is what they were forced to make, synthetic rubber for the um, German army and government. And so, you know, of these tens of thousands of concentration camps throughout Europe, there are ones that we've heard about, there are ones that we, we have not heard of before, and there are some that really were just horrific and terrible places, um, but in which German companies were in charge and German companies were making a profit um, off of the, the, the death and the destruction that was being, that was taking place. And something else that was interesting as well that I noted from looking at some of Esther's testimony was that, you know, we talked about earlier how she was part of this intelligentsia in Chestahova and she was really a community leader. You know, she was very well educated. She was a lawyer. Um, and th those were things that potentially, um, you know, put her forward for a position with the Judenrat or, or put her forward as a community leader. And then we get to this point and she talks about in her testimony that this was something that she was targeted for. So, you know, she had um, other prisoners or, or room elders in, in the barracks that 
would basically particularly target her because they knew that she was well-educated and she was this person who had, you know, a, a position within society. And so it was something that she kind of kept to herself um, at that time. Um, and so as we mentioned, um, Esther and her sister are deported to Robinsbrook and they arrive due to the, um, so of course now we're, we're fast forwarding in our timeline. It's now, you know, the end of 1944, um, the US has already entered the war and the Soviets are, and also have already landed in Normandy. The Nazis are facing a two front war and the Soviets have really pushed the Germans back. Um, and so the Nazis begin evacuating concentration camps in Eastern Europe. Um, and so Esther and her sister are sent on a death march and they arrive in Robinsbrook in January of 1945. And here you can see this is typed up um, notes that Esther wrote following the war. Um, just to, She documented and typed up her, his, her testimony many times in letters that she would send to people, in interviews that she would give. Um, you know, she was very, very dedicated to writing down her testimony. And so here she, you can read, she says, we were told to undress. We were subjected to a thorough and brutal body search for hidden gold and diamonds. I was given a torn skirt, a threadbare coat, a man's shirt, a pair of wooden sandals, but no underwear, no stockings. Esther and her sister were forced to work shoveling sand and pulling heavy carts to and from the disinfection chamber or loaded with lumber for the crematorium. Their meals consisted of rotten turnips and black bread. In February of 1945, Esther and Tamara were deported by cattle cars with hundreds of other women to Kalfering, a subcamp of Dachau. The trip lasted 16 days with little food or water. Many women died along the way, with Esther recalling that in our car alone, 10 young women died. They first became insane, then fell into a coma and went out like candles. I myself was twice on the verge of death, but was each time saved by a Hungarian woman who placed a pinch of salt on my tongue. So really horrific conditions. And I think it's so important to note that at this point in time, the Nazis are losing the war, um, tremendously losing the war. They were fighting a two front war. The US is already in France. They've already um, been to the Netherlands and the Bel in Belgium. The Russians are coming through Poland. They've already been through Lithuania and Ukraine and the Nazis are clearly and obviously losing the war. And instead of dedicating all of their resources to fighting that war, they're dedicating resources in the mass murder of Jews, um, as we can see in this testimony. Um, so for Masha in 1944, um, with the approach of the Soviet army, so a little bit before um, Esther's evacuation, the Nazis liquidated the Kovno ghetto. Masha, her sisters and her mother were sent to Stutthof and her father to Dachau, um, again, because of the Soviet army coming in. Um, upon arrival at Stutthof, Masha was separated from her mother and sisters. She later saw them again through the barbed wire of her barrack where her mother told Masha that they were being sent to another camp. Masha never saw them again. Masha was later transferred to another sub camp where she worked, walk, worked digging foxholes and peeling potatoes. In 1945, she was forced on a death march where she was liberated by Soviet troops. And all of a sudden, my mother in civilian clothes with my two little sister walked by and she said, they're taking us away. So I stopped hitting on those wires to let me out. So they left a dog and it bit a piece of my hand out. And that healed. And this is the last time I saw my mother. Now, I don't know. After the war, I learned about the Reisenstadt. Why did they take away the striped uniform because somebody told me they're in striped uniform the little one even a big one cut off in striped uniform why did they give them civilian clothes to take them to the crematoriums to the gas chambers but at that time i couldn't figure it out i only figured it out after the war after i learned what happened so I, for me still my mother my two little sister died in Stutthof, because there where they took them away from me. Never saw them again. And I wrote a poem about it. I don't remember all of it. I don't have it in front of me. I was a little girl lost and sad. My mother told me I was not bad. Then why the agony and pain the Nazis inflicted on me with whipping cane? 
The answer was unanswered because mother was no more. They took her away to settle the score. I can't go on anymore for a little while. I don't remember all of it, and I forgot to prepare it. I write poetry. Whenever I feel sad, I write poetry. Anyway, I never saw my mother again. So we, we, she was talking about, obviously, in that clip about the last time that she saw her mother, um, and she really didn't understand what was happening. They were in, they had been in, they had been given uniforms in the camp and then they had been changed into civilian clothing, which she didn't really understand. Uh, and, you know, they didn't know where they were going. Her mother said to her, we're being taken somewhere else and we don't know. And that was the last time she ever saw her mother and her two little sisters. Um, and from the same archive that uh, we were able to find a little bit more documentation on Esther, uh, we actually were able to find this document as well. So the document that we're looking at right now is actually for Marsha's mother. Uh, and it confirms that she was actually sent from Sudhof um, to Auschwitz at that time, where she was presumably killed. So following liberation, as we mentioned, Esther was liberated by the Americans um, in Dachau. And, um, you know, at this time, as I mentioned, the the Soviets and the Allied armies, or the the U.S., the French, and the British, had liberated all of Europe at the, by the end of the war, and they were dividing different areas of control. Um, and so, many many Jewish survivors were put in displaced persons camps (DP camps), where many received medical attention. They were on the verge of death. In fact. Survivors continued to die even after the after liberation, just because they were so starved and so um, sick with different diseases that they had caught uh, in the brutal living conditions in the concentration camps. And so um, Esther finds herself in a displaced persons camp, um, Landsberg, where she organizes memorials for Chestahova Jewish community. And here you can actually see um, some photographs from the um, the memorials that she's organizing in the displaced persons camp just months after liberation. And you can see here is this is actually from one of her typed testimonies. In 1946, I organized a Yiz Corps for the 50,000 Jewish victims from Chestahova. The Yiz Corps took place in the DP Camp Landsberg, Amlech, Bavaria, and was attended by 1,200 survivors from US, US and British zones. So almost immediately, as we can see, you know, Esther and her sister survive. They have witnessed horrific experiences, people being murdered, um, these really difficult decisions that they had to make in order to try and save their own lives. She already knows that most of her siblings, her parents, her nieces and nephews were all killed. And what does she do? She organizes community um, gathering. She organized commemoration. And this is a time when people do not know about post-traumatic stress disorder. In fact, that is not studied or discussed and, in, or identified until after the Vietnam War. This is a time when many people are focused on trying to rebuild some semblance of normalcy, um, trying to learn a new language, figure out where they're going to live, find out you know, where they should move, if they can even return home, learn a trade because they haven't obviously been in school the last few years, get a driver's license. And what is, she, is, what is Esther doing? Taking a moment and saying, we've lost and we need to mourn that and we need to commemorate that and we need to honor those people. Um, also, um, clearly with her passion for law, she attended the Nuremberg trials, which were taking place in Nuremberg, Germany. And then later she herself testified against members of the administration at the Hassab camp that she had been in, where she had been enslaved. So she went to, went to those trials and talked about the administrator, the administrators, the people who were in charge of the camp and gave testimony saying, these people did this and they needed to be punished. And in fact, they received the death sentence because of her testimony. She also acted, as Christy mentioned earlier, as a defense attorney in the Jewish honor courts in the cases of two men accused of collaboration for being in the Jewish police. And as we mentioned, I think firsthand Esther understood the really delicate and unique situation that Jews found themselves in when they became members of the Judenrat or the Jewish police, how it wasn't really a choice at all. And perhaps we don't know, we're just speculating. Perhaps she thought of her brother, his wife and their two kids when she represented these two men 
um, saying, no, they should not be found guilty of collaboration. Um, they really had no choice in the matter and it was the only thing they could do to save themselves. Ultimately, Esther and her sister immigrated to the US where Esther met her husband, Andrew, and the pair went on to settle in LA where they remained very much involved in many Holocaust related causes. Um, Esther um, you know, was part of the board of the 1939 club, which was a group in Los Angeles for Polish Jewish survivors. And of course she was very active in the Holocaust Museum as well. And so I know Christy has some photographs to show us. Yeah, so I have some of the photos that we're, we're looking at on the screen. So as Jordana mentioned, we have some of the images of Esther speaking at the at the uh, memorial that she had helped organize in the DP camp. Um, and some of the pictures of the, the crowd too, which is, I don't know if you can see, I'm getting some reflection. Um, and then, you know, even at this time too, it's, it's obvious that if you look at the other people that she's surrounded by that are also speaking, they're all men. So she's the only woman in that picture too. So, you know, that really speaks to um, what we've been talking about and what we see from her later that she really was a trailblazer and wasn't afraid to, you know, stand her ground and say, you know, these are the things that we need to do. Um, you know, at a time that was, I'm sure that, you know, you've just lived through this horrifically traumatic event. It had, organizing something like this might have been the last thing on your mind but you know something that is really important and continues to be important to her um, as we go forward into the rest of her life it was definitely something that she was passionate about um, you know and the whole holocaust and educating the public it was a cause that was close to her heart um, and you know as Jordana mentioned as well we have um, you know evidence from her that she was part of this Jewish honor court um, system, which was basically just a, essentially, you know, aside from the war crime trials that were happening at that time, um, this was a, administrative tribunals that were mandated by the local Jewish communities in the area. Uh, and they were essentially looking at investigating individuals whose behavior under Nazi occupation was really called into question. Um, so people like the Jewish police that were charged with assisting the Germans um, in, the, in liquidating the ghettos and deportations and um, other you know, Jewish prisoners that were um, basically seen to have been mistreating fellow Jewish pr prisoners in some of the concentration camps um, were essentially the, the most of the, the, made up the majority of the defendants in these cases. And so interestingly, we have obviously Esther's collection of materials, but then we also have two other collections that relate to um, two other men that she defended. So it's really interesting to see we have, um, like all of her handwritten notes where she was preparing for the trial. Um, I have some of them here. One of the, the, the collections actually, it's really interesting because um, obviously all the documents are in German and Polish. There's not a lot of English, but we have translations for some of them. So this is actually, there was a lot of letters that went back and forth. So you can see this is actually Esther's handwriting. I've become very familiar with it over the past couple of weeks. I would now recognize it anywhere. <laughs> Um, and immediately recognized it on some of the other documents that we found at the other archives for signature. Um, but yeah, at this time, you know, there wasn't a way to necessarily easily communicate with the people she was defending. So we have these letters that go back and forth between her and this particular one is from a, a man named Henrik and he was the man that she was defending. So there's these letters that go back and forth between her um, and Henrik and his wife talking about how afraid he is um, you know, that he's innocent and, and organizing the, the defense between them, basically, which, you know, paints a really interesting picture in itself. So we have a couple of those collections with a lot of the handwritten materials um, from her. And it, really, when you think about the Holocaust, it's a process of dehumanization. And so it's not just about survival, but it's about surviving with human dignity and maintaining just their own identity that is a form of resistance, really. And so for Esther to not only survive, but to be who she was and always was, an attorney, a community leader, um, a woman with opinions, which I'm sure was unique at that time, a woman not afraid to share her opinions and speak up and speak out. The fact that she stayed true to herself despite the Holocaust, I think is just so incredibly remarkable and really just is demonstrative of the ability of human beings to be resilient. Um, her resiliency is so unbelievable and really inspiring.
yeah and you know for for the fact that only they've at this point realized that it's just her and her sister Tamara they're the only members of their family that have survived um which is just I can't even imagine what that would have been like um to be able to you know pick yourself up and say okay well I'm going to help others and organize memorials and do all of this amazing work right after this horrific tragedy that's happened and then also you know the same as a lot of other survivors to be able to pick yourself up when you have nothing and say I'm going to move to a completely foreign country with a completely foreign language without knowing anyone um so when they the, the sisters immigrated to the U.S. to be able to do that is just incredible to me um but you know obviously it, it worked out because she ultimately Esther ultimately went on to meet her husband um when she came to the U.S. and joined a club worked as a secretary which is where she met her husband um and you know and then they resettled in in LA um and then got involved in all of these these causes which really just you know is a continuation of what we've been hearing about um so Masha is liberated by the Soviets um and so after the war she worked in a Russian hospital and actually reunited with her father who had also survived so she and her sister, or I'm sorry, her mother and her sisters had perished. And as we heard that incredibly moving and upsetting um, clip of the last time she saw her mother and her sisters um, and, and the poem that clearly helped her heal. Um, and again, at a time when people weren't really given the right attention or support or community space for healing, um, women like Masha and Esther were finding their own ways and forging their own paths to heal. Um, Masha lived in various displaced persons camps, as did Esther, including one in Linz, which is where she met her future husband, Cornel Cornelius, who was also a survivor. Um, they met in 1946, and the couple married in 1947 and immigrated to the United States in 1949, settling in Los Angeles, um, where they had their son, David, who was born in 1958. Yeah, so we're looking at some pictures on the screen here. Um, that is obviously a picture of Masha and Cornelius. Um, and, you know, they, it, it, I found out just recently, actually, from listening to some of her testimony, they were married in 1947. Masha was only 17 at the time. Um, and they met in that DP camp. So ultimately, Masha is reunited with her father, but she, and they can, like, they travel across Europe, um, you know, searching for a family and what have you. And ultimately, she decides to stay in Austria um, and goes to a DP camp, which is where she meets Cornelius. Um, and, you know, they were married for the, the entirety of the rest of their lives, um, came to the US and settled in LA uh, and had a son. And uh, again, ultimately, you know, similar to what we were talking about with Esther, you know, really passionate about remembering this history so that it won't be forgotten. Uh, and so are active in causes such as the founding of our uh, museum. And I know, Christy, you have some photos to show us. Yeah, so it's really interesting delving into this aspect of the museum's collection because it's not, um, you know, we obviously are know the details about our history, but it's not necessarily something that I've had the opportunity to jump into before. So right now we're looking at a picture of the, the founders of the museum and you can actually, I'll show you a bigger version of it if you wanna. Well, I think here's Masha, correct? Yes, correct. And over here is Esther. Correct. So, and you can see even in this picture, which was taken in 1979. Um, so a little bit of time has passed since the, you know, the whole thought and has been established of creating a, a Holocaust memorial. Um, but you can see even in this picture, the majority of that group are, are men. So we know that these two women were ahead of their time and were really, you know, trailblazers. I've heard Marsha referred to on more than one occasion as a force to be reckoned with. Um, and I definitely get that impression from all the materials that I have had the opportunity to look through. Um, so, you know, both of these women were dedicated to memorializing the people that they'd lost and educating about the Holocaust. Um, as the story goes, there was a, a meeting that happened in a, in a in English as a second language class. Um, and Marsha talks about this in her testimony that she met a man uh, that she had recognized from the boat that she came to the US on. Uh, and then, you know, there was discussion and various groups that were meeting at that time to talk about the possibility of, can we create some sort of memorial, um, you know, to, to memorialize the people that we've lost in this tragic event, essentially. Uh, and so 
these two women were involved right from the get-go in the inception of that idea, um, which is really remarkable at the time because like we've talked about before in, in the, this program, in the 1960s, um, you know, it was mostly men. So it wouldn't have been common to see, you know, women in this role. Uh, and it really speaks to these women and their strength. Um, you know, we have these photos, you can see mostly men, but also the age, Marsha in particular was quite a bit younger. So she was still a very much a young woman. Um, and so at that time, you know, to be able to have a voice in that group and, and hold her own really speaks to, to her strength, uh, which is really quite incredible. And I know you have some fun photographs. Yeah. So we talked about um, this photo already, which is which is slightly older. So this is 78 um, and is a, gr a group of um, the original founders. And so Esther is at the top here and Marsha is right here uh, with a group of the original founders of the museum. Uh, and then also, you know, as Jordan mentioned before, this was at a time when the Holocaust and the experiences that people went through really wasn't talked about and wasn't it wasn't common to have people talking about their experiences, talking to groups, talking to students, giving speeches about this kind of um, thing. And so we know as well that at that time, um, you know, we have as part of the museum's collection, this uh, collection of oral testimony, because it was part of, you know, the mission of the museum at the time to document the oral testimony of local survivors in the LA community at that time. And so we have some a photo of Marsha as well. So this one, so you can obviously tell which one's Marsha without me pointing her out. Um, you know, she has the most, the, all of the photos that I have of her, she has the most incredible different pair of sunglasses or glasses on in every single photo. Um, but yeah, so this photo was taken in 1983 and we know from the caption that it was actually the first ever um, taping or recording of the oral testimony of local survivors at the museum. So we're talking about in the 80s when again this wasn't a common topic to talk about and even you know the the, the large scale project that the Shoah Foundation undertook in in documenting all of this really important history really started in the 90s. So this was something that you know was part of the museum's mission from the get-go and and is part of our the core of our mission today and something that Marsha was very much involved in. Yeah, I mean, so today, of course, there might be a Holocaust movie coming out almost every year, um, but I really want us to try to imagine a world in which people are not talking about the Holocaust. People, as I said, understanding PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, does not take place until after Vietnam. Um, so this is already decades after the Holocaust is over. So for these two women really early on, when no one is speaking about it, to say, we need to talk about this, we need to document this, we need to commemorate this. Um, in the US, the first time the public really engages in dialogue around the Holocaust is in the 1970s, when there was this mini, do, mini short film, um, it was a series with um, Meryl Streep called The Holocaust. Um, and so that's like the first time really where people are introduced to the Holocaust as it took place. Um, and then it's again, very quiet. Nobody's really talking about it until Schindler's List in the 1990s. Um, so these women are founding a museum in the 1960s, even before this mini series comes out. And then in the 1980s saying, we need to document oral history. Um, Schindler's List by um, you know Steven Spielberg really was this moment in which survivors began to feel comfortable um, sharing their stories, but also communities felt comfortable wanting to hear them. Because if Steven Spielberg, this Oscar winning director could tell the story, um, so then they felt that you know they wanted to hear it. And this is when the Shoah Foundation starts after Schindler's List. So not even till the mid to late nineties. And here Christy is showing us that Masha Lowen in the early eighties was saying, I'm gonna interview Holocaust survivors and document it. It's just so incredibly remarkable. Um, that these two women were so very much engaged. And I know that when Christy was going through our archival collection related to Masha, we found thank you letters from students in the early 1980s um, writing to Masha, you know, thank you so much for sharing your story, for telling us about your mother and sister. So it's, it's May 24th, 1982, um, a letter from a teacher, um, you know, where she's writing that the students said that you know, that she must be a strong woman to stand there and tell strangers about the horrible things that happened to her and her family. Um, you know, 
many students were amazed that even such a museum exists. 1982, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC was not opened and founded until the 1990s. So just so unbelievable that these two women understood this. And I know that we can go on and on talking about the incredibleness of these two individuals. Um, I now will open it up for a little questions. If anyone has a question or two, you can drop it in the Q&A box. Um, if you have a question about the history or these two women themselves, um, please share. And it, you know, the work that the Holocaust Museum LA does today is because of these two individuals and is in honor of them as we continue commemorating, documenting and educating as these women envisioned the museum would. So it's just, thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing in um, learning about these two remarkable um, faces behind the museum. I know this was a lot of information that was covered. And I, I will say, you know, Christy, I'll ask you a question as we, as we see if anyone has, our audience members have any questions, but um, you know, what was your favorite artifact that you uncovered preparing for this? Oh, goodness me. Well, I mean, yeah, that's a tough one. I, um, I, I definitely, it definitely struck me that the testimony from Esther was incredible because to, to be so frank and so open about her experiences and so detailed, um, I really didn't expect that. When I opened the, the, um, the collection, I, I was thinking maybe this is going to be hard to have the appropriate information to put this talk together. But, you know, there was just this incredible wealth of, of testimony from her, which I wasn't expecting. Um, and actually we didn't get to it, but um, something that I just recently discovered, um, and again, this speaks to her as you know somebody who was just really a, a, a trailblazer and, and, and definitely had a, a strong voice and a passion um, about this history, uh, was that she continued to, you know, she testified in these trials against Nazi administrators and other people that were administrators in um, the camps that she was in. Um, but we discovered as well that there is other documentation going back and forth between herself and you know public prosecutors in Germany all the way into the 60s and 70s uh, where she's providing affidavits against some of these Nazi officials so you know she's still really um, trying to, to to testify to what had happened and 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 right those wrongs and and get some justice for for the family and the other people that she had lost I know it's it's really I mean these two women it's remarkable you know, where Esther fought in the court system, what she knew best, and Masha wrote poetry um, and continued educating. It was always really important for Masha to speak to kids, um, not just adults, because she really saw that kids were the future generation. And for these two women to be part of the founding survivors who said, not only do we need a Holocaust museum, but the museum should be free um, so that people can continue learning about the Holocaust. Um, so let me see here. We, um, oh, somebody asked if there's a book about them is one of the questions that we got in. Um, we do not have a book about them. Um, so really, you know, I think oftentimes founders of museums, sometimes that's not the main focus, but we're, we're hoping and working on uncovering more information and providing more information about our founders because we're so proud of their history. And hopefully there'll be a book in the future about this. And you can actually, so Marsha has a Shoah Foundation testimony. It's not available online, but when the museum is reopened, it is one of the testimonies that you can actually come into the museum and listen to. Uh, it's quite long, but it's very detailed about her life. And Esther's um, testimony is actually available or will be available as part of our digital collection. So it's actually available to the public that you can read um, some of the testimonies that we've been talking about that are part of her collection. Um, so I just want to be really respectful of everyone's time. I think Christine and I went a little bit over because we were talking about two extraordinary individuals. We could have done much longer about them. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us this evening for this month's Inside the Acid Free Box. We look forward to seeing you again next month. Um, but in the meanwhile, we definitely invite you to listen to a survivor in our community, Martha Sternbach, speak on April 1st, virtually, of course. And then of course, join us for our Building Bridges diverse communities responding to rising hate crimes on April 7th. You can find information about these two programs and all of our virtual programs and offerings at hmla.org or holocaustmuseumla.org. Thank you so much um, for joining us today.
And if you're interested in accessing documents and um, archives, or if you have continued questions about the Holocaust, you can visit our website. You can reach out to Christy or reach out to me, and we can direct you in different ways. If you're more interested in learning about either of these two women or the dozens of survivors who are involved in our museum and seeing that our mission to commemorate, educate, inspire continues and has always been fulfilled and met. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Christy, and have a great rest of your evening.